Hello, welcome to Healing School. I'm Bob, and you're watching Grace City Church, and this is our Healing School. We do this every Thursday, and we invite you to tune in if you have, uh, if you're fighting symptoms in your body, if you're fighting a disease, if you're fighting some kind of uh, anything, we are here to help you, to teach you, to lead you into the healing that Jesus Christ provided through his word, through the body and blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we want you whole. We want you healed. So today I'm, I'm going to continue with a, a, a series that I started. Uh, I believe it was a week or so ago, and it was um, compiling some stuff from both Gloria and Kenneth Copeland dealing with healing. And so I'm going to continue with that. And today I want to talk about traditions and how traditions within the church, within the body of Christ, how it can actually be a troublemaker and cause problems when it comes to receiving and accepting healing. Hallelujah. And we don't want, I don't know about you, but I don't want anything blocking my way to being made whole and healthy. Faith should be as highly developed in the church concerning healing as it is for the new birth of the Spirit. If the church had been told what the Word says about healing, Christians would be as quick to believe they are healed as they are to believe they are saved. However, other things have been sown in their hearts. Seeds of doubt and unbelief have been sown by the traditions of men who try to teach the word with head knowledge instead of his spirit. God's word doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. Men try to explain it through their own natural thinking, but they never succeed because they have no revelation knowledge of the word. Men in pulpits across our nation have preached things that are simply not true. Traditions cost people the healing power of God. Jesus said the traditions of men make the word of no effect. He said that in Matthew 15, 6. Perhaps you've even believed some of these fallacies. One tradition that, was, that has robbed the church of healing is the practice of praying, if it be thy will. You should know it's God's will to heal you before you ever pray. Now, last week or the week before, uh, that's what I taught on was God's will to heal you. And you need to go back and watch that. You can know God's will or you can know because God's will tells you his will. The word of God is the will of God. If it be thy will is unbelief when praying for healing. There is no faith in that kind of prayer. It is the opposite of faith. If you are praying, Lord, heal me, if it be thy will, then it is obvious that you don't know what the will of God is. And until you know, you don't have any basis for faith. But you can know God's will because it's in his word. Another tradition we have heard is, is that healing has passed away and miracles don't happen today. We all know that God doesn't change, James 1.17. He has not changed since the beginning of time. He said, I am the Lord that healeth thee in Exodus 15.26. For healing to have passed away, God would have to pass away. He is still the same Lord who heals us. Miracles and healing power of God are just available now as they were when Jesus walked the earth. I know that's hard for some people to accept and believe because of the traditions they've been taught, but it's true. Those things are just as much available now as they were when he walked the earth. You can believe that God heals today. Miracles have never passed away. Some people just quit believing. It takes active faith to receive from God. Just believing in healing is not enough. 
You must believe that it is God's will to heal you. You have to believe that healing is yours, that it belongs to you. Another tradition tells us that God gets glory from Christians being sick. But the Bible says people gave glory to God when they saw the lame walk and the blind eye see. People glorified God of Israel when they saw his power in manifestation. Jesus said the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit, John 15, 8. Cancer is not fruit. Arthritis is not fruit. The world is not impressed by your sickness. They are not impressed because you bear up under pain or agony. They have all the pain and the sickness that they want to have, what they can handle. They are looking for a way out of sickness and disease, not a way into it. They have enough problems. They want answers. People are oppressed by Satan and need deliverance. They want victory in their lives. They want to know how to pay their bills and be free of sickness in their bodies. That God gets glory from his children being sick makes no sense. But more important, it does not agree with the word of God. As believers, we are to be lighthouses of deliverance and help in a dark world. God's will is that we show forth his love and power to the hurting world around us. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. The world is supposed to see good works in our midst, not sickness and disease. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Philippians 2, 15 through 16. Our commission is to give forth the word of life, the word of God concerning salvation, the word of God concerning healing, the word of God concerning deliverance to those around us. Instead, because of the traditions of men, we have tried to tell the world that the God we serve has made us sick. What a lie. I'm going to say that again. What a lie. What a lie to tell about the God, Father God, who is the God of love and mercy. Jesus said that we are to lay hands on the sick and that they will recover. His will is that his body, the believers, be the answer to the problems of sickness and disease. We have been told by him to alleviate the problem. Teaching people that God wants them sick only adds to it. Another tradition that has been well taught is referred to as Paul's thorn in the flesh. From 2 Corinthians 12, everyone seems to have heard about it. Tradition teaches that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness or disease, but the word plainly states that the thorn was a messenger from Satan. In the New Testament, this Greek word is translated messenger seven times an angel 181 times. All 188 times this word is speaking of a personality, not a thing like a sickness or disease. Sickness is not a messenger, nor is it a personality. Satan sent an angel or messenger to Paul to buffet him. The word buffet means to give repeated blows over and over and over. If you're sick or if you've been fighting illness, how many times have you sat there and thought, this again? How come I get this every year? How come I can't get rid of this? It just keeps coming back again. You're being buffeted. Weymouth's translation says, concerning this, three times have I besought the Lord that he might leave me. 2 Corinthians 12.8. The 
The King James Version says, For this thing I have besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. The thorn in the flesh was not a sickness, as tradition teaches, but a messenger from Satan, as the Bible teaches. God does not use Satan's messenger service. God did not give Paul this thorn in the flesh. Satan sent Paul the thorn to stop the word from being preached. We're not going to allow the sickness in you to stop from preaching the word. The terms thorn in the flesh or thorn in the side are always used as illustrations in the Bible. For example, the Lord told Moses that if the Israelites did not drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, they would become pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides. That's from Numbers 33. The Canaanites were not sticking it to the Israelite side. This is just an illustration. Today, we still use the term a thorn in the flesh. Your neighbor might be a thorn in your side. In the same way, we say that this guy is a pain in my neck. Tradition says this thorn was something in Paul's actual flesh. But 2 Corinthians 12, 7 is the same type of illustration. Weymouth's translation of this verse says, There was given me a thorn in the flesh, Satan's angel to torture me. This evil spirit was assigned to Paul in order to stop the word. Jesus said in Mark 4 that Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Paul was having to stand against the evil spirit everywhere he went. When Paul asked God to do something about his messenger of Satan, the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee. Tradition reads that he asked the Lord to deliver him, and the Lord says no. Therefore, Paul had to endure the thorn forever. The Bible actually says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made whole and perfect in weakness. God was saying, my favor is enough. You have authority. You have the name of Jesus. And when you're humanly weak, my strength or my power is made perfect. We can see an excellent example of this in Acts 14. When Paul was stoned, he was dead, but the disciples gathered around him and prayed and the Lord raised him up. It was humanly impossible for him to do anything. In his own strength, he had no ability to overcome. But when he was humanly weak, the power of God was strong. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Paul wrote, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Infirmity means want of strength, weakness, indicating an inability to produce results. It does not mean sickness. It means what the Lord said, when your strength ends, my power is made perfect. The other things mentioned here, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, are the buffering or buffetings of Paul lists in 2 Corinthians 11. He was in prison, stoned, beaten, shipwrecked, and attacked by angry mobs. Sickness is not mentioned in that. We have heard a lot about trials and tribulations that came on Paul, but tradition forgets to mention that Satan's angel could gain no victory over Paul through adverse circumstances. Paul lived to be an old man. When it was time for him to go, he said he didn't know whether he wanted to stay or depart. Paul did not go home to be with the Lord until he and the Lord were ready. And that should be the same with you and I. He was a victorious Christian. He wrote most of the New Testament. He traveled throughout the wor known world. Satan's angel never could stop the word of God from going forth. Paul's own testimony was, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time for my departure is at hand. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's written in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. That is not a description of a man who was sick or weak. Glory to God. Paul was a victorious man. He said, persecution, suffering such as occurred to me at Antioch, in Iconium, at Lystra, persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Tradition forgets to tell us that. Paul faced trials and tribulations, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. The thorn in the flesh that we have heard so much about could gain no victory over Paul and the word of God. The messenger of Satan could only aggravate and harass Paul. He could not stop the word from going forth. There was a big difference between being aggravated and being defeated. In every situation Paul faced, even death by stoning, the power of God was made strong and delivered him. This is teaching that the church, this is a teaching that the church needs to hear. When human strength ends, the power of God excels. Hallelujah. You can see how helpless we have been with traditions planted in our hearts and minds. Instead of God's word, you cannot stand in faith against sickness and disease when you have been taught that sickness is God's will for you. How can you stand in faith for your healing when you think God has put cancer on you to teach you something? This tradition is an abomination to the nature of God. God wants you healed despite what tradition says. That is the truth. In a bullfight, the bull doesn't know who his enemy is. He thinks the red cape is his enemy. If he ever realized his real source of trouble, that matador wouldn't have a chance. Many believers are just like that poor bull. They are battling red capes instead of getting to the real source of their problems. They are contending against the trouble instead of the troublemaker. And traditions are a troublemaker. Who is a troublemaker? Who is the real source of all of your troubles, whether they are spiritual, mental, physical, social, or financial? If you knew, you would no longer struggle against the red cape of your problems. You would eliminate the very source of them, just as that matador was no match for that mean, ferocious bull The troublemaker is no match for the believer who battles him with the full armor and mighty weapons of God. When sickness or trouble arises, the most natural thing to do is to place the blame for it on someone or something. Sadly, for the most part, many Christians have been falsely accusing God of being the cause of their troubles. This is the number one deception sown in the church today, that our problems, our sicknesses, and our temptations are sent by God to teach us. This lie says the trials and tribulations are God's tools for developing and strengthening our character. The extreme end of this deception is that God himself is end of this deception is that God himself is the author of our troubles or that he is the one who makes us sick in order to teach us something. This is absolutely against the word of God. Why? Because the very basic principle of the Christian life is to know that God puts sickness, puts sin, sickness, disease, sorrow, grief, and poverty on Jesus at Calvary. For God to put any of this on us now to teach us or to strengthen our faith would be a miscarriage of justice. To believe that God has a purpose for your sickness would mean that Jesus bore your sickness in vain. Can you believe that? That if God puts sickness on you, that is believing that Jesus wasted his time on that cross. What an insult 
to his love and care and compassion towards you. Jesus loves you so much. He went to the cross. He bore your sickness on himself just as much as he bore those pains and sufferings for your salvation. In order to place blame where it is due, we need to refresh revelation. We need a fresh revelation of who our true source of trouble is. The only way we will receive this revelation is by rightly dividing the word of truth. James 1.8 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And Jesus said in Luke 11.17 that a house divided against itself will fall. Therefore, if a man thinks, imagines, assumes, or in any way has the idea that God is behind his trouble, either by permission or commission, he will never resist it. And if he doesn't resist it, then he will certainly fail because his hesitation will give Satan just the edge he needs to defeat him. In the world of the spirit, there is a challenger, a counterfeit, an opponent of God who knows his business. But there is also the armor of God, the word of God, and the power it takes to defeat this opponent. The word says to resist Satan and he will flee from you. But when a man is in a hesitating area, not opposing, but wondering, then Satan can easily defeat him. We must clearly distinguish between what is coming from Satan and not blame God for something something especially he's not behind. This is why it's extremely important to rightly divide the word considering the, concerning this issue. John 10.10 10 is the dividing line between life and death. The thief, Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You know what? That life happens in this life. It's not something that we wait for in the by and by. Satan is a thief. He is trying to rob the body of Christ of its power. The believer has the whole armor of God available to him, and Satan has no defense for that armor. Instead, he must deceive the believer and sidetrack him. He must operate in the world of natural because in the world of the spirit, the believer can beat him with his powerful spiritual weapons. The sword of the spirit, God's word, can wound Satan deeply, so he uses deception. He comes against the believer in the physical world and tries to convince him that God is actually the one who made him sick, or that God took his baby, or that God wants him to live in poverty. If the believer entertains these thoughts for any length of time, he will begin to doubt. He will hesitate. He will become double-minded. That hesitation will give Satan a valuable advantage. Then the next time he attacks, the believer will be a little easier to defeat. Don't go easy. The believer must decide not to back up any longer. The man who is single-minded on God's word has to know for sure that God's will was Jesus on the cross and that God's will is for him to be in health. We must know God's will is to meet all his needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus and for him to receive the blessings of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ. When these facts become a reality on the inside of him, then he becomes a powerful believer, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He knows that his father has carefully planned for his deliverance and victory. From that point forward, he'll never question whether or not he ought to be healed. He is no longer on the defensive. He is on the attack. He no longer hesitates. He is constant and stable. 
You know, that's one of those things that the armor of God, we, we shod our feet with the gospel of peace. The Roman sandals, their Roman shoes that they had, the, the, the soldier, they had spikes in them so they could stand their ground. That's why we put on that armor. We want to stand our ground against an enemy that's trying to knock us down, knock us back, and convince us of these lies. Jesus said he would build his church on the rock and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Or in other words, the power of hell would not succeed against it. That rock is the word of God. Jesus likened the man who acts on the word to a man who built his house on a rock. When the storm beat vehemently against the house, it stood strong. You see in this parable, and this is from Luke 6, 48 through 49, the same storm beat against both houses, the one on the rock and the one on the sand. It wasn't the storm that made the house strong. The house was strong before the storm hit. It was built on a firm foundation. This is how the body of Christ is to be, built on the firm foundation of the Word of God. Become single-minded. That's what we need to do. Become single-minded. Some people call it being narrow-minded. Well, I'd rather be narrow-minded than receive everything that comes at me. Become single-minded. Make the decision. Choose life and blessing. Decide to win. Decide to overcome. Until this decision is made, you will be double-minded. But the moment you make your decision to be a winner, you will be out on top. There will be times when you will have to stand and be patient and consistent. But when a man is consistent on the word of God, he will know the truth and the truth will make him free. The word of God will make you free from every sickness and disease. Yeah, you're gonna have to dig your feet in. You're gonna have to have a resolve within your spirit, within your mind, and within your body that regardless of what you see, what you hear, what you feel, you're going to take your healing. And that means to take the traditions of men the things that you've heard, the things that you've seen that are not of the word and to stand against the devil until every cell in your body screams, I'm healed. That's what we want for you today. Thank you for joining us. If you would like prayer for healing, you can contact us. You can go to hello at gracecitychurch.tv, leave us an email, ask for prayer. We will pray for you. Or you can contact us at 870-741-9099. Leave a message and someone will get back with you. We would love to pray with you. We want you healed. We invite you to come back and join us every Thursday for Healing School. And if you happen to be in the Harrison area, you can join us for our services here at 700 Cottonwood Road in Harrison, Arkansas. We hold services starting at 930 and 1030. Come, plan, join us. We would love to see you. We would love to pray for you because we want you healed just as much as Jesus does. Thank you for being here, and we'll do this again next week.